Hello everybody and welcome to the third audiobook of The Cliffs. This is He Told Me Everything. I am so excited for this one. Uh, I was excited for The Breaking Wheel um, and I am more excited for this one because I've been told on f from many different people that this story is one I need to read literally now, as soon as possible. <laughs> And it's a good thing I am, because I am reading this the second day of release. So that's that's very good. Um, just if you haven't seen the format of these audiobooks before, I am going to be reading through the book with you. Um, I have not read it before, so all of the reveals, uh, everything is going to be my reaction, and I'm also going to give a few opinions and theories and stuff at the end. Um, but that that's it, really. That's all you need to know. So... Let's begin, he told me everything, which is about Chris, which is kind of sus. <laughs> I wish we were a nice family, Chris said. He and his parents and sister sat around the second-hand dinner table, eating hot dogs and canned baked beans and macaroni and cheese that had come from a box. What the heck is that supposed to mean? Chris's dad said. He was still wearing his uniform from the garage with his name D Dave stitched in cursive letters over the... Shirt to breath, fuck it, oh no. Oh. <laughs> Dave Miller, yeah, um, yeah, already there's a connection there. And I really hate to say it, but that technically means that Chris Afton is a possibility. <laughs> no, I don't think it is. I don't think it is, because, um, you know. There's a reason why I don't think it is, which I can't really say because it's spoilers for another story, but I really don't think this is what the story is getting at. So hopefully that's nothing, but that's pretty big already that his name is Dave. Anyway, do you think we're all a bunch of jerks or something? I mean, look at your mum. Is this the face of somebody who isn't nice? Chris's mum flashed an exaggerated angelic smile and fluttered her mascara painted eyelashes. And what about your little sister here? She's not nice. Chris's dad pointed a forkful of macaroni and cheese in Emma's direction. Oh god, it begins with E. <laughs> I'm very nice, Emma said, pushing her glasses up on her freckled nose. She was in fourth grade and was, Chris thought, bossy beyond her years. She gestured at her green uniform, complete with a sash full of badges. I'm a Girl Scout and everything. See, it doesn't get nicer than that, Chris's dad said. And everybody who knows me says I'm reasonably nice. The guys at the garage, my customers, my buddies I go bowling with, people tend to like me, or at least they generally don't run away from me when they see me approaching them. He reached for another hot dog, a mistake given his growling waistline, Chris thought, and squirted it with an excessive amount of mustard. So what do you mean when you say our family isn't nice? Chris felt like his father had misunderstood him. This was a, this was a regular occurrence. No, you're all nice people, Chris said. That wasn't what I meant. What I meant was, Chris searched in vain for words that would express his thoughts without offending his family members. I guess I don't know what I meant. But really, Chris knew exactly what he had meant. His parents were decent people, good citizens who loved their kids and worked hard for their family and community. His little sister was annoying in the way younger siblings were, but he would never say that she was a bad person. That being said, when he compared his family to the families of the smartest kids in school, they fell short. Part of it was his parents' education, or lack thereof. His mum had started working as soon as she graduated high school and still had the same job at the utility board she had gotten when she was 18. After Chris's dad finished high school, he had gone to vocational, uh, to vocational school to learn how to work on cars. He had an excellent reputation as an auto mechanic, but that job didn't strike Chris as prestigious enough. His dad came home every day dirty and smelling like axle grease. In Chris's opinion, truly successful people didn't need to take a shower as soon as they got home from work. When Chris went out for, with his parents to a restaurant or a store or a school, school function, he always felt embarrassed. His mum was loud and flashy. She wore the brightest colour she could find with the reddest lipstick and the biggest, shiniest costume jewellery. His dad, despite the daily after-work showers, always had grease under his fingernails, so he never looked quite clean. And then there was the matter of his weight. Chris's dad, belly protruded over his belt. Uh, sorry, Chris's dad's belly protruded over his belt, and sometimes his shirt rode up, such that the great shelf 
of his distended gut escaped and hung out for all to see. When he sat and his pants slipped down and his shirt rode up in the back, what he exposed was even worse. Chris knew his parents were nice. He just wished they could look nice and act appropriately in public. The smartest kids at school and parents who always knew how to look and act. The dads wore jackets and ties or khakis and uh, polos. The, nu the mums wore tasteful blouses and dress slacks and subtle expensive jewellery and makeup. These parents were professionals, lawyers or engineers or medical doctors. They had careers that required years of schooling beyond high school. This was the kind of carer Chris wanted. The kinds of jobs that Chris's parents worked led to a deficiency in another area, money. They weren't poor, no. They owned a house, but it was a plain dumpy house, barely big enough for a family of four, and the, and the furniture was mostly hand-me-downs from Chris's grandparents. His mum and dad each had a car, but both of the vehicles were ancient and only kept running because of his dad's mechanical know-how. They had a creaky old shared family computer, and Chris's video game console uh, was so tragically out of date he couldn't buy new games for it anymore. They only got basic cable. Honestly, who just had basic cable these days? When Chris rode around town on the school bus, he always noticed the subdivisions that were full of fancy two-storey brick houses. He liked to fantasise about the families who lived in them, the doctor dads and lawyer mums and their high-achieving kids, all dressed in designer clothes, eating grilled salmon and steamed vegetables and salad for dinner and then lounging in rooms that looked like they were ready to be photographed for one of the home and garden magazines he always saw in the waiting room at the doctor's office. That was a long sentence. <laughs> the parents probably played golf and tennis at the country club while their kids splashed around in the pool. There were never any worries about how to pay for the kids' college once they were old enough. That's what Chris had meant by wishing they were a nice family. He wanted a nice life for them, with nice things, and a bright future for him and his sister. Surely it wasn't so wrong to want, to want more out of life than scraping by every, sec, uh, by every month just to pay the bills, than having to buy the off-brand items at the grocery store just to save a few cents. Emma, it's your turn to do the dishes tonight, Chris's mum had said as they were finishing the meal. Okay, mum, Emma said. It annoyed Chris how cooperative she always was. Didn't she ever get sick of doing the same chores over and over? Chris, I told Mrs Thomas you'd help take out the trash tonight. Mum said, getting up from the table. After that, you can take pork chop for his after dinner walk. Pork chop. Uh, Chris didn't want to do either of those tasks. Why were parents always exploiting kids for free labour? Mum, he said, trying to keep his voice from rising to a whine. I'm busy. Tomorrow's the first day of school and I've got to get ready. Taking out Mrs. Thomas's trash and walking pork chop will take 30 minutes tops. That gives you plenty of time to get your stuff ready for school tomorrow. He could tell from the tone of his mum's voice that she wasn't going to pick up with an argument. Okay, but I won't like it. I know you won't like it, him, his mum says. It's part of my evil plan to oppress you. She did a fake laugh like a villain in a cartoon. Come on, I'm trying to make you laugh here. Emma, who was already clearing the table, laughed, but Chris wouldn't give the mother a satisfaction. With a theatrical sigh, he got up from the table and left by the back door to go to Mrs. Thomas's house. Mrs. Thomas was old, so old that Chris's parents were always amazed that she still managed to live alone and take care of herself. She had been a high school teacher for over 40 years, teaching Chris's parents along with many generations of the town's high school students. Now, though, she had been retired and widowed for many years and lived in a small boxy book cluttered house with just her cats for company. She cooked and did light housekeeping herself, but Chris's parents helped her out with anything that required heavy lifting. Or at least in the case of the garbage, they forced Chris to help her. The arrangement was that on the night before garbage day, Chris would come to Mrs. Thomas's house, empty all the trash cans in the house, and take the bags to the big garbage pail in her driveway, which, would, which he would then take to the side of the road so it would be ready for pickup next morning. Chris had once asked his dad if he could be at least paid for this weekly responsibility, but his dad had said, Sometimes you don't do a job for money. You do it because it's the decent thing to do. Chris had taken that as a no. Chris knocked on Mrs. Thomas's door and prepared to wait. She moved slowly and it always took her time to answer. When she finally came to the door, she was wearing the same yellow cardigan she wore year round, even now when it was hot outside. She was a tiny, 
delicate, bird-like woman. Her glasses were thick, and her hair was thin and grey. Hello, Christopher. It's so nice of you to come over and help me. She was the only person who ever called him Christopher. Sure, Chris said, but really it wasn't a matter of being nice. It was more that he was still a kid, and so when his parents made him do something, his only choice was to do it or suffer the consequences. Please come in, she said, holding the door open. There's just one bag of trash that needs to go out. It's in the kitchen. The house was dark and smelled musty. The walls were lined with full of bookshelves. Um... Oh, with full bookshelves, yeah. And every piece of furniture in the living room had at least one cat sleeping on it, sorry. He followed her into the kitchen. Could I interest you in some cookies before I put you to work? Mrs. Thomas asked, gesturing to the cat-shaped cookie jar on the kitchen counter. No, thank you. I just had dinner. Mrs. Thomas's cookies were the cheap kind they sold at the 1990... 99 cents store, and they were always stale. After taking her up on the cookie offered twice, he had learned to say no. Well, that's never stopped me from having a cookie or two, Mrs. Thomas said, smiling. Your mother tells me you're starting high school tomorrow. That must be exciting for you. Yes, ma'am, Chris said, anxious for this conversation to end so he could get back to doing the stuff that really mattered. She was bragging about what a good student you were and how much you loved to learn. You know, I taught at your high school for many years, English literature. If you ever need help with anything academic, just let me know. And if you ever want to borrow any of my books, you're always more than welcome to. Thanks, but I'm more of a science guy than a literature guy. Don't put yourself in a pigeonhole yet. You're too young, Mrs. Thomas said. And there's absolutely no reason you can't be a both a science guy and a literature guy. There are so many wonderful things in the world to learn. Chris lifted the garbage bag, filled mostly with empty cat food tins, out of the trash can. I'll take this out and then roll the big can out to the road, okay? Mrs. Thomas nodded. Thank you, Christopher. You're such a great help to me. Chris walked back toward his yard. He knew Mrs. Thomas was trying to be nice, but it kind of it, it was kind of sad that she thought she could help him with school stuff. She had gone to the lit, little local college a bazillion years ago, then taught high school English until she retired. It wasn't like she had she was some great intellectual. Plus, she was so old she had probably forgotten what little she had known. He was sure she could teach him nothing. Chris opened the gate to the fenced-in backyard where Porkchop was wagging and waiting. As soon as Chris was inside, Porkchop jumped up on him and craned his neck so he could lick Chris's face. Get down, Porkchop. You're getting me all muddy. Chris backed away from the dog's dirty paws and tried to dust off his pants. Chris had wanted a dog, but Porkchop was not the dog that he had wanted. Chris had wanted uh, one of the smart, beautiful, purebred dogs he had seen on dog shows on TV a border collie, or a Shetland sheepdog. But his dad had said they couldn't afford a purebred dog, and that anyway, it was immortal. <laughs> no, not immortal. Yeah, I've got William Afton on my, line, on my mind. It was immoral to buy an expensive dog from a breeder when there were so many good dogs in shelters that needed good homes. And so one evening when Chris was in sixth grade and his dad had come home with Porkchop, a brown and tan overgrown snaggletooth shelter mutt who bore no resemblance to the elegant herding breeds Chris admired, it was immediately clear that Porkchop also lacked the intelligence to learn the tricks or agility skills Chris had dreamed of teaching a dog. Instead, Porkchop was a happy idiot <laughs> whose favourite activities focused on his belly, either filling it or getting rubbed. Ready for your walk? Chris act, asked without much enthusiasm. Porkchop made up for Chris's lack of enthusiasm by wagging, barking, and running in small circles. If you won't sit, I can't put your leash. Uh, if you won't sit, I can't put your leash on. Chris said. He couldn't believe how much time he was wasting carrying out his parents' orders. He attached the leash to Porkchop's collar. Once around the block, and that's all you get, he said. Walking through the neighbourhood was depressing. The houses were small and identical little boxes which had originally built, been built for workers in a steel mill that had been shut down many years before Chris was born. Into the pit? Hmm? <laughs> the yards on which the houses sat were postage stamps small. He was sure he was the only kid in the science club who lived in such a lousy neighbourhood. He hoped he could keep where he lived a secret from the other kids, who, he was sure, all lived in the fancy neighbourhoods on the west side of town that had, that had names like Wellington Manor and Kensington Estates, 
As promised, he took Porkchop around the block once, then brought him in the house and emptied out a can of dog food into his bowl. Porkchop happily gobbled it up. Finally, with all his chores done, Chris could go to his room and start getting ready for the first day of high school. Not only did he need to get this backpack filled and organised, but he also had to decide what he was going to wear. His mum had taken him shopping the week before and bought him five shirts, three pairs of jeans and some new sneakers. But they had gone to this awful big box store because his prices were affordable. What Chris had picked out looked okay, but he wished he could have a real name brand clothes from one of the good stores in the mall. His mum said nobody could tell the difference, but he knew that was a lie she sold, uh, she told, to try to make him feel better. Still, Chris was feeling hopeful. The first day of high school was a fresh start, a chance for him to prove himself. A whole new ball game, as his dad would say. That man never met a cliche he didn't like. The thing that Chris was most excited about was joining science club. At West Valley High, Mr. Little's science classes and the club he supervised were legendary. Mr. Little's classroom was lit by plasma balls and lava lamps and, string, and strings of glowing bubble lights. He was famous for demonstrating spectacular experiments that involved fire or carefully controlled explosions, though he said he made sure his students didn't work on anything that would put him in actual danger. He was also famous for jump-starting student projects that um, produced extraordinary results and almost always won science fairs when Va West Valley competed with other schools. Science Club was famous for bringing back numerous trophies for West Valley, and Science Club students had the reputation of being the school's highest achievers. On Freshman Orientation Day, when the new students were given the opportunity to sign up for clubs, Chris had made a beeline for the Science Club table. It was the only club he had signed up for. Why waste your time on anything inferior, Chris thought, when you can be with the best? Chris was especially looking forward to this weekend, which was the traditional lock-in, that Mr. Little held every year for his students. The entire class would spend the night at the school working on a secret project of Miss, Mr. Little's design. It had the reputation of being a life-changing experience, one that secured your status in the science club and the school. Chris wanted his status to be the best of the best. Chris, your friends were at the door. Chris's mum called from the living room. Josh and Kyle, Chris thought. He felt vaguely annoyed. He had a lot of preparation to do to ensure he made the right impression on his first day. He was in a serious mood, but Josh and Kyle were never serious about anything. Be there in a minute, he yelled back. He finished loading his backpack with school supplies before he went to the door. At least he could get that done despite the interruption. Josh and Kyle were waiting in the living room. Josh had let his hair grow out over the summer and it hung in dark brown waves over his shoulders. Kyle had dyed a purple streak in his hair and was wearing a t-shirt for some band with a skull and crossbones on it. Chris was a little nervous about the fact that Josh and Kyle would also be starting at West Valley High tomorrow. They had been his friends since they were preschoolers, but he hoped they wouldn't all hang over him during school hours. They were nice guys, but he feared the image they projected wouldn't go over well with the science club kids. He didn't want his old friends to hold him back from making new higher status friends. Hey, Josh said pulling his hair back behind his ears, uh, a habit he had picked up since letting, it go, uh, let, since letting it grow. It's our last night of freedom. Yep, Kyle said. Tomorrow they lock us back up and throw away the key until next summer. Actually, I'm kind of excited about going back to school, Chris said. I mean, it's high school, you know. Same thing with a different name, Josh said, sounding like he was bored already. We were going to ride our bikes over to the dairy bar, then go down to the lake. You want to come? Of course you are, Chris thought. It was what they always did, but he supposed he might as well come along for the old time's sake. Tomorrow his life was going to change. It would be full of smart friends, science projects and academic achievement. The bike rides and ice, and ice cream of childhood would just be a memory. Sure, why not? He followed the boys outside and got his bike. Race you to the dairy bar, Kyle yelled, like he always did. They took off. Chris intentionally didn't pedal as fast as Josh and Kyle. He figured he might as well let them win. There were many achievements in his future, so maybe he should let one of them win the race to have some small sense of accomplishment. Soon he would be leaving them in the dust in other ways. Josh won. Not that it mattered. At the dairy bar, they each ordered their customary... Customary... Cu yeah, customary... <laughs> sorry, I've, that, that word looks really weird to me, suddenly. Um, chocolate vanilla swirl cones and sat down at one of the wooden picnic tables to eat them. 
Even though the ice cream was good, Chris could still imagine better treats he would have in the future once he had risen to the social status he aspired to. Then he would eat luxurious desserts he had only read about or seen in TV. Crepes Suzette, molten chocolate lava cake, creme brulee. I haven't seen you on the server much lately, Chris, Kyle said. In middle school, they'd like to meet up online to play Night Quest, a popular multiplayer game together. Yeah, I guess I've just had some more important things on my mind lately, Chris said, licking his cone. Why? Is something wrong? Josh asked. Nobody in your family is sick or anything, are they? No, nothing like that, Chris said. I've just been thinking about, you know, the future. The future? Like with robot overlords and flying cars? Josh asked, grinning. They were so incapable of, be incapable of being serious, it was infuriating. No, Chris said. Like my future, my goals, what I want out of life. That's some pretty heavy thinking for summer break, Chris, uh, Kyle said. At the beginning of the summer, I take my brain out, put it in a jar, put the jar on the shelf and don't take it out scanning until, uh, until school starts. It's like a tongue twister. Joshua laughed. So what you, what, eh, so that's what you'll be doing when you get home tonight, putting your brain back in your head. Nah, I'll probably wait until morning. No need to start thinking any sooner than I have to. Josh and Kyle were both laughing, but Chris couldn't muster a smile. How did he even end up being friends with these losers? He supposed it was because Josh lived next door and Kyle lived across the street. They had been flung together because they were the same age and lived in the same place. If Chris had grown up in a nicer neighbourhood, he would have ended up with a better class of friends. After they finished their ice cream, they got back on their bikes to go to the lake. What they called the lake was really just a large pond. Once they got there, they did the usual. They looked for flat stones to skip across the water. They tried to approach the Canada geese. They laughed when the geese hissed at them. They talked about video games and internet memes and nothing in particular. <laughs> Looking out at the lake that was really pond uh, that was really a pond, Chris thought of the word stagnant. That pond was going nowhere. It wasn't a river or even a little stream that flowed and went somewhere else, became part of something bigger. Instead it just stayed it just sat there, growing algae and gross bacteria going nowhere and becoming nothing. Unlike the pond, unlike Josh and Kyle, Chris had no intention of stagnating. He was going places. Chris woke early on the first day of school. He took a shower, brushed his teeth aggressively and applied a double coat of deodorant. He ran a little gel through his short, nearly cut sandy brown hair to make sure it wasn't going any place. He put on the polo shirt and khakis he had set out the night before. He wished again they were a better brand but at least they were clean and new. Hey, there's my big fresh man. <laughs> um, Mum said when he came into the kitchen. She assaulted him with a hug. That's weird. Assaulting with a hug. Um, Mum, stop, Chris said, squirming away from her and sitting down at the table. He poured himself a bowl of cornflakes and started slicing a banana over them. Mum sat down from across from him, holding a cup of coffee. She had already done her hair and makeup for work. As always, it was a little too much, in Chris's opinion. Her hair was dyed a shade of red that wasn't found in nature, and she was wearing a leopard print top, black leggings, and leopard print shoes. She wished she would aspire to simple elegance instead of cheap glamour. I know you get tired of me talking about how big you've gotten, she said, but when you are a parent someday, you'll understand. You start with this little tiny baby with the toes the size of corn kernels, and then it seems like no time passes till your baby's so tall you just have to look up at him. Chris didn't comment, just crunched his cornflakes. What was that to say? He had grown. It was what kids did. It wasn't like it was some great achievement or anything. Anyway, I'm proud of you, his mum said. Proud of your sister too. It really seems like she should still be a baby, but you, you should have seen her this morning. She got herself all ready and walked to the bus stop. So independent, she smiled. There was a little smear of lipstick on her front tooth. Say, I don't have to be at work till nine this morning. Do you want me to drive you in your first day? Chris nearly choked on his cornflakes. He didn't want the science club kids at his new school to see his overly made up mum pull in with her 10 year old ec economy, economy car, sorry, that rattled and wheezed like somebody's great grandpa. <laughs> what kind of impression would that make? No, thanks, mum. I'll take the bus. What did I say? Independent. His mum reached over and ruffled his hair. Now he would have to comb it again. On the school bus, Josh and Kyle were sitting next to each other. When Chris boarded, Josh said, Hey Chris, time to turn ourselves back into the jailer. Huh? Chris ignored him. There was an empty seat across the aisle from Josh and Kyle. But he ignored that too, and found another empty seat 
further back on the bus. It was better to be seen alone than to be seen in the wrong company. He looked around the bus, trying to figure out if any of the kids looked like they should be in science club members. West Valley High was much bigger and more crowded than Chris's old middle school. In the hallways, he had to concentrate to keep from running anyone over and not to be run over himself. It was hard to concentrate on navigating the hallway when his brain was consumed by one thought. Third period is Mr. Little's class. Third period is Mr. Little's class. After what felt like an eternity and a half, third period arrived. Chris and his classmates crowded into the room at the end of the hall and beheld the bizarre wonders of the Mr. Little's classroom. Chris took a seat and looked around. The walls were plastered with posters, some outlining the, sci the scientific method or showing cell structure, others displaying science-related puns and wordplay. One said, in science, matter matters, and another, think like a, like a proton, stay positive. Ha, <laughs> classic jokes. <laughs> I would say a chemistry joke, but all of them are gone. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> the shelves that lined the room were filled with more scientific curiosities than Chris could take in at once. The one nearest him displayed a, a variety of glass jars filled with clear flu <laughs> fluid and different biological specimens. Sorry, I'm still laughing from my amazing joke. Um, one jar held some poor creature's heart. Another housed a fetal piglet with two perfectly formed heads. Yet another contained what looked disturbingly like a human brain. Mr. Little stood before the lab table at the, at the head of the classroom. He wore a white lab coat over a collared shirt and a brightly coloured necktie printed with the design of a DNI, uh, a DNA helix. Love that. I love Mr. Little. He was a small, energetic man, the literal incarnation of his last name, and he was smiling like the master of ceremonies in a particularly exciting show. His safety goggles worn over his regular glasses made his eyes look huge and insectoid.